people rebuild their homes. And when they, different people ask me, why are, we, why are you doing this? My, my response has always been, I believe this is what God wants us to do. God wants us to be doing good in our community. He wants us to use every opportunity that we've got or we have that we've been given to do good to those that we encounter, even to those who are of the household of faith. But in doing all of this, all we're simply trying to be is the church of our Lord. Tonight, I want to direct your minds for the few minutes that we have together to Colossians chapter 1. There in verses, beginning in verse 24 and going through verse 29, the Apostle Paul has something to say to us, I believe, about the energy he expended in the work that he was engaged in with the brethren there in Colossae. And in this passage, there are some statements that I want us to lock into, draw from, and look at what we're doing and the things that we can learn from that and why we are pressing forward as we do. In verse 24, he says, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, and filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me, for your benefit, so that I might fully carry out the preaching of the Word of God. That is, the ministry which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to His saints, to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom so that we may present every man complete in Christ. For this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power which mightily works within me. This idea, we proclaim him. That's what Paul is talking about. But the question for each of us is what does that entail? Well, in, in our text tonight, there are four statements that Paul makes that begin with I. I call them I statements. And in this, we see that there is a devotion that Paul has to his cause, to what he is doing. And as we look at those I statements, I think that we find for us as well our devotion to what we are doing. The first of those statements is found in verse 24. I rejoice in my sufferings, he says, for your sake. Paul endured many sufferings as he brought the gospel to new places. If you go over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, you begin to see toward the end of that chapter a number of statements that Paul makes concerning those sufferings, things that he endured simply because he was proclaiming Christ. There in verse 24, he says that he had received five beatings from the Jews, 39 lashes each. You can figure that up. Almost 200 stripes with which he had been beat all because he was preaching Christ. In verse 25, he talks about being beaten with rods three times. In verse 25, the latter part of that verse, he says he was stoned twice, shipwrecked three times, or stoned once, excuse me, and shipwrecked three times. And then in verse 27, he talks about those many sleepless nights in hunger and thirst, often without food, cold and exposure. And you know, none of us have had to suffer what Paul suffered to proclaim Christ, to share the good news. But Paul understood something, and here's the key that he brings out here, and it is that the sufferings that he endured, he's telling the Christians at Colossae, were not only for Christ's sake, but also for the sake of those Christians there in Colossae. So here's the thing. If you and I are privileged to suffer for the cause of Christ, Paul says we should rejoice. If we're enduring a little bit of affliction here, Paul says rejoice. Because we're serving Christ. Ultimately, we're doing God's will. The second I statement is found in verse 24, the latter part of that verse. He says, I do my share on behalf of his body. Now, if you look at that, the body as he's speaking is the church, the body of Christ. So, as Paul is doing his share, he's doing his share for the church. Any great effort is doomed to fail if enough people are not doing their part. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. 
a basketball team on the court, a football team on the field, a baseball team on the diamond, an army marching forward into battle. If enough individuals are not doing their part, then that game is going to be given over to the opposing team because the team is not doing their, there are members on the team that are not doing their part. The army is going to lose the battle because enough of the, those fighting the battle are not doing their part. A company is going to fail because enough people within the company are not doing their part. And a church will not accomplish its mission because enough people aren't doing their part. It's important that each one of us ask ourselves a very important question, and that is, what can I do for Christ and His church? What talent, what gift, what ability has God given me that He expects me to use in His service? How can I use that to best serve Him? The third I statement that Paul makes here is found in verse 29. He says there, I labor striving according to his power which works mightily within me. If you notice there at the beginning of that, I labor striving. He puts two verbs back to back. I labor. It was a verb that in the original language was often used to describe the work that left a person so weary that that person felt like they'd taken a beating. Maybe you've heard the statement some people will make when they, when they feel like they're just wore out, I've been road hard, put up wet. Well, people that have been around working animals, especially riding horses, you know you, you finish riding that, ho that horse, you take the saddle off, you brush it down, you rub that horse down, you don't put it up wet. Road hard, put up wet. It was an idea that spoke about working to the point of exhaustion. I labor, I am working to the point of exhaustion. And then the second verb that he puts there, striving, it is from the Greek verb, or it is from which we get our English word, agony, literally to agonize over something. It referred to engage in something with great intensity and effort. So what is Paul saying? What Paul is saying is that when, when we put these two verbs together, he is indicating to us that he is he engaged in the work he was doing with tremendous energy. And he was pouring that into his ministry, doing everything he could, even to the point at times of physical and emotional and perhaps mental exhaustion. You know, I believe that this church, a lot of the members of this church, have done the same thing over these last four months. That they have been pouring tremendous energy into the work in which we have been engaged during this period of time. The fourth I statement that Paul brings out is this. He says, I make full the Word of God. In all that he's doing, in his labor, in his striving, what Paul was doing was working to help people come to know the Scriptures so that they might also know Christ better. It was the Word of God that he was working toward. And it's ultimately what we are seeking to do here. Our goal as Christians, our goal as the body of Christ here in this community, ultimately, is to open the Word of God and to make it full, not only for those of us here within this facility, those of us who are part of this body of Christ, but also to our friends and our neighbors in this community so that they too might come to know Christ. And, and we want everyone to have the same advantages in order to know Christ that we have known over the years since our obedience to the gospel, maybe even before that, and what led us to our obedience to the gospel. We want that same thing for those that we encounter every day. And so here's something we have to do. We have to see what we're doing here as more than just feeding hungry bodies, cleaning out or rebuilding houses, delivering furniture, bedding, appliances. Now what we're doing in all of that, our ultimate goal is to help the people that we encounter on a daily basis come to know Christ. And we do all of these other things 
believing that God will open that door for us to do that. We're working to make Christ known in our community. That's what we're trying to do. Having said that, there's a method to our work. And there's two things that Paul brings out here, both of those uh, in verse 27, or verse 28, <clears throat> excuse me. He says here, first of all, we admonish every man. What Paul was trying to do by admonishing every man is Paul was seeking to put right what was wrong so that people might have the right spiritual attitude there in Colossae. And sometimes that means that we've got to go against the, the flow. We've got to stand against the current. In another passage, over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, there in verse 24, Paul speaks about the Lord's bondservant. And here's what he says about that individual, and that's what all of us are. We're the Lord's servants. Here's what he says. He says, the Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape what he called the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. There are times when we do have to correct. But he says that the Lord's bondservant is not a quarrelsome individual when he does that. The Lord's bondservant is kind. The Lord's bondservant is even patient when he himself is wrong. And he is one who seeks to correct with gentleness. And so there are times that that's what we try to do because if there's anything that we're working against at times, it's the wrong ideas that Satan seeks to implant within people's minds all over this world. So admonishing every man. But then the second part of that, he said, is teaching every man. If you go back and read through the Gospels, 41 times you're going to find that Jesus is referred to as teacher. 41 times he's referred to as teacher. What is a teacher? Those of you who've taught, what is a teacher? At the very heart of it, at the nature, the very basis, what are you? You are a person who is seeking to impart knowledge and hopefully some wisdom through instructing others so that they might learn and grow by what they've learned. If you go to Acts chapter 8, we encounter there an evangelist by the name of Philip. Philip has been in Samaria, had great success in Samaria. The church is growing in Samaria, but the angel of the Lord calls Philip away, and he tells him to go down south to a road that runs from Jerusalem down to Gaza. It's a desert road. In other words, there's not much on that road. But there is an individual that the angel of the Lord wants Philip to meet. And as he arrives there, along comes a chariot. And in that chariot is the treasurer for the queen of the Ethiopians, whose name is Candace. His name is not given. He's simply called an Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip is told to go and join yourself to that chariot. So he runs along beside him, and he hears him reading from the writings of the prophet Isaiah. And he asks him a question. He says, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how can I except someone should guide me or explain it to me? And he invites Philip up into the chariot with him. And Philip begins at the same passage of Scripture where he's at, and as Luke records for it, he preaches unto him Jesus. Philip took the time to tell him about Jesus. And our goal is to use the opportunities that God affords us here in our community in all that we're doing to share Jesus with those that we encounter. To use those opportunities to share him. So, how do we measure our success? How do we know if we're, if we're gaining, if we're doing what we need to do, two things Paul brings out, and I'll give you the lesson tonight. Verse 27, he talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ in you. What does that mean, Christ in you? Simply put, 
our goal is to help as many people as possible come to faith in Jesus Christ. And, and through that faith, obedience to the gospel, being buried with him in baptism, because you and I know that their baptism into our Lord's death is going to result in a new life because they become a new creation in Christ Jesus. Old things are passed away, as Paul would say. And because Christ is in that person, there is an eternal weight, and we've looked at this a few weeks ago, an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison that awaits them. Christ in you, the hope of glory. When Christ is in that person, when that person comes to obedience of the gospel, then there is a great hope that awaits that person. And folks, we are achieving some success. But the second thing is, he says that he wants to present every man complete in Christ. The goal of admonishing, the goal of teaching every man is to present each individual as a mature individual in Christ. So at the last day, when they, when all of us together finally go before our Lord in judgment. What our Lord will see is that we have been able to bring men and women to maturity in Christ. And our goal is to present them, each individual before God, as someone that is holy and blameless and beyond reproach, as he would say back up in verse 22 of this of Colossians 1. Last week, Kyle stood up here, and what he said to you was he talked about believing that God has great things in store for this congregation. I agree with him. I believe that the same is true. And, and we, many of us, have already seen some of the great things that God has already done in the last four months through this congregation and for this congregation. And Paul even told the Christians at Ephesus, Ephesus, that God is able to do above and beyond all that we could ever ask or think according to the power that works within us. According to the power that works within us. Paul, if you remember, said he wants to present, he talks about the Lord working mightily within him. The question for us is, will we hinder God from working mightily within us? Or will we work Till he comes, asking him to provide us the strength, give us the guidance, so that we might present each man complete in Christ, so that we might be able to teach every man, we might be able to admonish, we might be able to bring others into the fold through the proclamation of his word. That's what we want to accomplish. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not a Christian. I want to start with you. I want you to be one of the first of those to obey the gospel. I'd like to see you become a new child of God. There's no better way to end this year and begin the new year. And if you're a Christian and you know, I'm not doing all that I can. I need to labor for the Lord. I need to be engaged in doing what He wants me to do. I want to encourage you to begin joining with us in serving Him here. Let us all work together. Let us look forward to the day when we will stand before him together. And let us live our lives in obedient faith. If we can encourage you, if we can help you obey the gospel or in any way, pray with you and for you. We invite you. Won't you come right now as together we stand and sing.